2019, make it to China. Um, okay, so first of all, thank you for everyone that came today, all the participants, the judges that came specially here, and the guest speakers. Um, so, um, the contest of Tea Hero started in 2014. It takes place in 19 cities, so nine cities globally. I'll show you in a bit all the countries <coughs> that we are taking part in, and 10, country, and 10 cities within China. Um, or so far, there was uh, 2,877 applicants, and it's taking place in Guangzhou, in Tianhe District, which is the most uh, wealthiest district in Guangzhou, China. So these are the nine cities. We have Berlin, Paris, Toronto, <coughs> New York, San Francisco, Tokyo, Singapore, Sydney, and Tel Aviv, which is basically the third time that we are presenting it in Tel Aviv. Um, basically, the competition is helping startups to understand better China, understand the supply chain, the manufacturing, and we are helping them with mentorship, which is basically here. So um, the startup is five in one. Uh, we are now in the competition phase. We also have strong mentorships, which will take place where all the startups, the 10 finalists, <coughs> Well, 10 finalists are here, three from each city will end up in uh, Guangzhou. So we have, um, yeah, all the startups will get there and get incubation, one-on-one um, -on -one sessions, there is media exposure, mentorship I mentioned, and $100,000 worth of cash and prizes. <coughs> so the Greater Bay, um, I don't know if you're familiar or not, but it's com bind of a lot of uh, interesting cities. Each city and district has its own unique sectors where they are specialized in. Guangzhou <coughs> is specialized in automotive, fashion, textile. Um, Shenzhen is mainly factories of um, technology. Um, we have all the rest. Hong Kong, fintech and tourism. Uh, so basically it's quite interesting because now there is the high-speed train which is connecting all the Greater Bay Area, so it's connecting Macau, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Guangzhou. Um, so you can basically, from Hong Kong, get within 30 minutes to Shenzhen and less than an hour to Guangzhou. And uh, now it's going to be the, um, China's future technology innovation hub to connect with the world. So this is the timeline. Um, so the three finalists from each city will arrive in the end of um, October to Guangzhou. There will be one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions, workshops, so they can understand how to set up a company in um, China and uh, to do the IP protection and understand about the manufacturing in China. Later on, on the 2nd of November, there is the actual uh, Guangzhou International Festival, Innovation Festival, and media exposure will take place there. Um, the competition of Tea Hero Make It to China will be on the 3rd of November. And then we'll be having some tours. So on the 4th of November, it will be a tour in Guangzhou. On the 5th, it will be in uh, Shenzhen. And then the 6th would be a day off, free day. So I'll explain a little bit about Brink. Um, so basically, to explain a little bit, we are at Brink, we are hosting and we are organizing the Tea Hero competition in the name of the Chinese government Guangzhou, dist um, Guangzhou Tianhe District in collaboration with the Startup Grind, which is our local partner. So in each city, uh, we are collaborating with Startup Grind um, to help us on the ground. So Brink is an accelerator program that is based in Hong Kong, the headquarters in, in Hong Kong. So far, we have invested in 79 companies. Uh, we are having eight programs and six global locations. We are mainly investing in, or we are focusing on IoT, drones, robotics, food tech, uh, assistive technologies, etc., etc. And now there is a video which should be working, but I'm not sure it's working. Go on. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, you need a permission. No, that's not the question. That's the, that's the question. Mm -hmm. that is Sorry.
Can, okay. So now, should we go back to the presentation? Um, yeah, one? I thought was it? Nah. Okay, we'll get back to the video later to explain more about Brink. Sorry about that. Um, so now uh, let's uh, yeah invite Nir to talk about the presenting all the startups. Thank you. Thanks, Hila. Applause for Hila. Thank you. Thanks, Hila. Wonderful. Good evening, everybody. We're now going to the part of this evening. We're going to have a viad later, which is the other part of the evening. But now for the exciting part of the competition, we're going to hear now. 10 pitches of 10 wonderful, exciting startups, which are going to present, each and every one of them will have three minutes for a pitch, and then two minutes for questions and answers from our judges. Okay, please, guys, we're going to have a very strict timeline, so please stay focused, stay tuned to what you have to say. We've got three minutes, okay, and we're starting, we will be announcing the three winners, like Ila explained, will be going to China soon. So let's begin with the first startup. Let me invite Sensegrass, which will be the first presenter. Last call to Sensegrass, are you here? Okay, so if Sensegrass is not here, um, uh, we'll uh, go on to the next uh, startup, and if they come, then we will, uh, by the time that our competition ends, then uh, we'll let them uh, present. Okay, so. Let's see, the next one is Magan Filtration. Guys, applause. Hello, good evening, my name is Uriah. The second one, Magan. Three minutes starting now. Uh, ready? Yeah. yeah. Start, please. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. I'm uh, we are from the uh, Magan Filtration, and we have startup that uh, invent uh, one filtration, one microphone filtration uh, automatic backwash filters. Let's go over. There is a gap inside filtration. Beli below one micron, there is membrane, RO membrane, UF membrane, all other membrane. Above 20 micron, there are the traditional filters. There is a gap, a black hole in between one to 10 micron which there is no automatic or no actually no good solution of filtration and that's the gap we are gonna fill. And we are also owner of a desalination plant. So we understand about water and we understand about what is to replace 1,000 cartridges every three weeks. So that the, was the motivation for Magan filtration. So our vision is to redefine this segment of one to 10 micron, which is a huge segment and very important in many application and to bring the revolutionary auto automatic backwash into this filter segment which now only having disposable filters in this. We are going to do that also by a very environmentally friendly solution. So there won't be any chemical and of course we don't have to get rid of the cartridges or the bag filters so you don't throw them or have to bury them or burn them or do anything that damage the environment. So 
If you would like to understand about this market of one to five, one to 10 micron, this is a huge market of $8 billion, which involves around many applications, such as desalination, as I mentioned before, potable water. You, don't, you cannot drink without a very good filtration ahead of that, or even if you need to purify it, you need to first filter it to a very fine filtration. Also, municipal wastewater. To reuse the water, in Israel, 90% 90% of the water go to irrigation. You need to filter territory treatment, which is the treatment that we can use. We can show and we can uh, offer, not like not uh, anybody else. In the industrial uses, there are many applications for the process before the factory is starting to uh, uh, need to go to the machines, or after in the reuse of the water and in many of the cooling towers and other uh, cooling and systems around the factory, which all of them need very fine filtration. So all of those uh, and others got back to the $8 million. So we can replace with two of our filters, the cartridges, which are the common solution today, and the bag filter, which are all disposable. You need to get rid of them after they get dirty. And there's also the sand filter that have automatic backwash, but it uses a lot of uh, uh, water, like five or seven percent of the water for the backwash, we use less than one percent. Furthermore, to get below 10 micron, which is the demand for all the other application we saw so before, you need to use chemicals in the sand filter. We all do all that without any chemicals. So we have two filters. One is called the Schiff, which is a very unique. We use fibers. We are experts Thank in you. fibers. How much? Time is out. Time is out. Yeah. You should have noticed. Yeah. Just finished the so uh, We have line. two filters, yeah. one is called shift yeah. filter, the other you can go further on, called fiber disk filter for different capacities, also different way of method. Let's go further on. No, no, we no, have no. done a lot of pilots and proof of concept. In Singapore also, this one is a sample of one of the biggest uh, uh, desalination water in Singapore. So we have innovation in two, uh, two unique filters. We don't use any chemicals. We save all the maintenance, all the OPEC cost. And we are seeking for partners, strategic partner, to either m help us with mass manufacture because we have already in the market, but we need to go to mass manufacture or marketing Thank efforts. You. So thanks. if you have any questions, Sec thanks a lot. Thank you. First, guys, we have we e w they were the f the first ones. Thank you. So, <laughs> applause. Just please, just please, uh, Yaron here for the next presenters. Yaron here is with the, with the stopper here, so you can, it tells you how much time you've got left. So please stay tuned to him. Uh, exactly. So please pay attention to Yaron. Now we're going to turn to our four honorable judges, referees, but they are judges, which is Omri, Aviad, Roxanne, and Ila. So each one of you will have two minutes. If any of you have any questions to... First of all, thank you so much. It's a fascinating idea. Um, just two questions. First of all, what's... Uh, I mean, I didn't saw any slide about the team. So, I mean, you are by yourself or there is a team behind you. So, uh, I mean, if you're a founder or you have co-founders as well. And second, why do you think that China is the right, uh, right market for you to penetrate? Okay, this is a company that is uh, based and owned by Kibbutz Magan Michael, so it's not mine. Mm. There are uh, uh, nine people in the company, among them mechanical uh, engineers, four mechanical engineers, one environment engineer, other practical uh, water engineers. So there is a lot of knowledge around that. And we see China is uh, in two perspectives. One is for manufacturing, and the other is there is a lot of demand for uh, water treatment in China and the regulation getting worse and worse or better and better the way you look mm -hmm. and they need the uh, solutions such as we can offer. Okay. Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. <coughs> um, do you have any active use cases in which you were able to demonstrate the value of uh, what the company is all about? Yeah, we have done a proof of concept in all of those applications we have mentioned. There's also in the slide, even in Israel and outside of Israel, for example, the one I showed in Singapore, uh, in wastewater treatment, in uh, municipal uh, water, uh, industrial uh, applications. So we've done a lot of those. Actually, the, two la the last two years were targeted for those to build a portfolio of uh, study cases and pilots that we have done. Understood. And do you have uh, any ROI calculation of the benefits of the initiative? Yeah, this is one of our solution. This one lasts for five years. The cartridges can last between two days to three months. So we have, 
we have a, a economic comparison <laughs> for other solutions that I mentioned before, so we can show them in variant application, because of course the water quality is also very uh, critical to the process of uh, uh, maintenance. Last question. What about competitors? Is there anyone out there that is uh, building something like that? Uh, not really. There are a few things that are similar, but none of them is having the uniqueness of our technology, for example, the fiber that is not wounded in any side. So there is a, it's a washable cartridge called the Holy Grail of filtration. So we're trying to reach to that. There are some things that connect to that, but nothing like us. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a Thank lot, guys. Much, guys. Please, applause. Good luck to everyone. Okay. Thanks a lot for, for Magan. They were the first brave ones. So, the next one is Dasmit. So, please, let's hear it for them. And the one, next one after, get ready, is Leviathan Energy. Okay? Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Starting now. Hi, I'm Ofer and this is Dasmit. So air, we all need air. Uh, we don't think about this, it's just there. Um, yeah. But the world is changing. We live more and more in closed spaces. We even started growing our food indoor, and now our air is filled with bacteria, viruses, mold, and allergens. And uh, nowadays, doctors just tell patients to try to ventilate the homes as much as possible, and indoor growers load on different solutions and uh, systems in order to try to clean the air but current solution have uh, pricey filters and uh, <coughs> the produced byproducts and are simply ineffective and it does me to have a revolutionary highly scalable solution to clean all of these organisms without any of these problems our device simply draws the air in kills everything inside and send the air back uh, clean and healthy uh, so we're going to operate in both markets the HVAC and the indoor agriculture uh, um, industry. We're going to collaborate with uh, uh, HVAC companies in order to integrate our technology and uh, to system worldwide and we're going to directly manufacture a purification system for the indoor agriculture uh, industry. So uh, up until today we've proven our patent pending technology with uh, an independent lab twice currently running an uh, indoor uh, with an indoor growing company uh, field test to show and uh, to try uh, to uh, and prove our system on the field. Uh, like I said, we're going to uh, integrate our, syst our technology to uh, create game-changing products. We're going to uh, show the indoor agriculture our technology is a must for all scales of operation. And in order to scale up fast, we're going to raise, we start raising uh, $5 million. So if any VCs or investors here, please approach me later. So China. China is a unique country. It's a vast land with uh, abundant agriculture history, yet, mo yet most of its population is concentrated in huge cities. And these cities suffer air pollution leading to asthma and increased allergies, driving the market toward find a suitable air purification solution. And uh, also it invests time and money in developing an uh, indoor uh, agriculture system to feed its future population. And all of this makes China a prime target for us to develop strong ties and seek out uh, business opportunities. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> now time for questions. Please. Hi. Hi. So again, um, the team question, if you can... Uh, yeah, uh, the team includes uh, three people. Uh, myself, I'm an aeronautical engineer. Uh, David, the, our CEO, is a veteran in the medical uh, devices uh, industry. And uh, my wife is a family business. She uh, does the operation of uh, the company. Okay, and uh, regarding, the, was there indoors and outdoors, or mainly the two of the solutions? The, the main problem is in the indoor uh, industry, okay. because mold and uh, bacteria tr uh, tend to accumulate there. And uh, like I said, indoor growers now, they don't have a good solution, and our solution, like 99.9%, there uh, comes out clean. Okay, wonderful. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Good. Can you tell us a bit about uh, your competitive edge vis-a-vis -vis the market? Yeah, um, current solution have uh, pricey filters. Most of them, the HVAC uh, users and the indoor growing use uh, HEPA filters and all types of other filters. And those who don't use filter produce dangerous byproducts like ozone and uh, 
uh, like uh, particles, <coughs> charged particles. We don't do any of this. We don't have any byproducts. Like I said, we simply take the air in, we turn it as it is with all the particles inside, the, but everything is just dead and ineffective. Also, elegans that we, it's, uh, it's uh, important to know that essentially they are dead. Just the human uh, and pets uh, um, immune system recognize them as threats. So after passing through our device, it does not recognize them anymore as threats. So it helps on also uh, allergenic uh, people. And, and can you tell us a bit about uh, potential customers and what their reaction to the product has been thus far? Yeah, uh, it's an interesting fact. We started in the medical devices and uh, we are drawn to the agriculture and indoor agriculture field by our customers. People approach us and ask, them, ask us to come and uh, uh, do a field test with them, with an indoor uh, growing company. They're developing uh, indoor uh, uh, growing systems and they heard about our solution. They approached us and that's how we learned about uh, the importance of that uh, the device to uh, indoor growers. Thanks a lot. Let's hear it for them. Thanks a lot. Sorry, I have the bad man's uh, row here. Yeah, I'm, I have to cut in everybody. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Next one is Leviathan, please. Thank you. Microphone is over there. St Hi, starting I now. I just got here from Ben Gurion just to see all of you and talk about water pressure. So, uh, water pressure is the essence of how you run a water system. Now, there are two issues with that. Number one, it's usually handled by pressure breakers. But a lot of the uh, pressure throughout the world leads to leakage. And guess how most uh, water systems solve leakage? They pump even harder, which consumes more energy, et cetera. So this is a major problem. Water shortage is now like the oil shortage. The World Bank uh, has estimated around $14 billion a year is lost in uh, water that is lost through excess pumping. Okay, next. So the solution is our turbine here. This is the old solution, a pressure breaker. It's a cost. Here, we do hydroelectric pressure breaking that enables two for the price of one. You get the work of a pressure breaker and you get renewable energy out of the excess pressure in a water system. Next. So beyond that, beyond solving that problem, there's a bigger problem, which is developing the demand response for connection between a water system on a large scale and an electric grid on a large scale. Uh, and that is part of the future of this after we uh, get more of these into a water system, okay? So the key technology difference that we do that nobody else does is that anybody can put a turbine in a pipe, but how do you control the variations in pressure and how do you control the downstream pressure so the water system can keep functioning? No one else has solved that. Let's go on. Um, there are, are over $30 billion worth of markets. The major one is water systems, but it can also be used for rural electrification, irrigation, green building, a lot of other uh, uses. Next, please. Uh, we've had experience. We've had installations in the Philippines with Mekorot in Israel, uh, a grant from the Israeli chief scientist. Next. Uh, we have a team. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, I've had many years and, and a lo lot of run awards in renewable energy. Aviel Sella is in the audience. He's an expert in cloud and uh, mobility. Uh, so that that's, uh, he's going to work on that part, on the software connections, and also a professor of mechanical engineering. Next. So what do we want from China? We want a place to do the la uh, most updated uh, uh, version and to find a place to build it and a place that's looking for water solutions and energy solutions. And the approach is to approach municipalities there. So that's it, we have a unique solution, large market, and we offer something that's important for the world, solving both the partially the energy and the water problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Going to question, who is the first one to? Hi. <coughs> Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Thank um, you. What's the ROI? I mean, what do I pay and what do I get back? So in general, 
it w let's say three years. Okay. So in, in what sense? I get paid so, back by what? So let's say you have a 10 kilowatt project and it costs $2,500 per kilowatt hour. Uh, 8,760 hours in a year times 10 kilowatts, 87,000 kilowatts per year. And if the cost of electricity is 10 cents, it's a three-year payback. Understood. Um, what about uh, competition? Do you have uh, anyone that is building something somewhat similar to that? Um, yes. Um, uh, uh, there's nobody that comes close. Uh, there's a company called Lucid, which um, has put turbines and pipes. Mm -hmm. They have a horrible efficiency. They basically take a vertical axis lift type turbine and stick it in the water. And if uh, you look on their website, uh, they give examples of what they've done, but they, uh, they never tell you what their efficiency is. So if you figure it out obliquely, you see it's very low. Also, um, unfortunately, unfortunately, they're an American company that our crowd actually invested in instead of in mine. Okay, which is Israeli, you know. But anyway, one of their board of directors came to me and he asked, you know, it's really not doing very well. We'd like to ask you if you could be the original equipment manufacturer for them and they'll sell your th solution. But the other members of the board outvoted him. So uh, that's the best competition. That's what everyone asks me about. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Can you tell us a bit about your business model? And uh, is it a one-time payment? Is it a recurring payment from customers? Both. If a municipality wants to buy, that's great. But I believe the best way to get onto the market and the best way to deal with governments is to be um, budget neutral for them. And that would mean to finance it for them. Uh, and by financing it, let's say we put it in for free, you get a pressure breaker, but we keep the value of the electricity. There are a lot of ways to work it out, but I think that's the, something like that is the best business model because it requires, uh, because it de-risks it for the customer, and it also means that they don't have to deal with their budget committees and so forth. Thanks a lot. Applause to Leviathan. Thank you. Thank you. Next startup is Lavatech. Applause, guys. Start it now. Hi, everyone. So uh, within the next uh, two decades, we will need 70% more food, which is quite a lot. Uh, very good news is that indoor farming industry is currently worth over $100 uh, billion and is growing at 70% rate. Bad news is that it's extremely, extremely inefficient. And the highest cost is comes from energy consumption, and 98% of the energy consumption is wasted into lighting. Yeah. So my name is Tatiana, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of LavaTech. At LavaTech, we have developed a combination of hardware and software, basically control unit and the software, that helps to decrease energy consumption for the old lighting systems by up to 90%, and for the LED light systems up to 75% without losing any efficiency. If we are talking about indoor farming, it means that we can also increase yield by up to 20%. That's what our pilots already show, but we believe we can shoot up to 40%. <laughs> The uniqueness of our startup comes not only from the technology, but also from our business model. We are the only one on the market who is offering light as a service, which means we provide access to the hardware, software, and database of the optimal growing conditions based on a monthly fee and the size of the facility. I have quite an outstanding team. There are 12 of us who is working full time, four PhDs on board. We, for example, our CFO has been CFO to the company who has been generating close to one billion in revenues. Our head of sales, has been leading sales for Tesla in Finland uh, for several years. Uh, I have two technical co-founders with each of 20 years of experience in chemical and electrical engineering, and then one more business co-founder with over 12 years of experience in B2B marketing for hardware startups. We have won various startup competitions, been supported by EIT Food, EIT Climate Kick, went through Alchemist Accelerator in Silicon Valley, and then we've also been announced as top 100 um, energy startups at the World Energy Summit this year. Um, why we are going to China? Firstly, we are still partly hardware, so we need to produce hardware, and we are looking for hardware production in China. We are actually already in contact with manufacturers, but I would want to have a closer contact. And then secondly, um, we are close to closing the round, and 
Uh, one of the people who are investing into our round is the co-founder of Tesla. I can t let you know a bit more about it later. Um, and yes, basically, uh, the other thing we want in China is not only production, but also distribution partners for Asian region. We have uh, uh, 13 pilot customers. We have 40 customers in the pipeline who are willing to pay for our product, but we are just not able, we are not able to supply at the moment because currently our production is in-house. Yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. What a nice presentation. Judges, who's the first one? Questions? First of all, thank you for the beautiful presentation. Um, I would like to hear a bit more about your uh, business model because for me it's very interesting. Uh, the, how you call it? Light as light a service? As a service. Yeah. yeah, light as a service. So uh, we basically take all the guesswork out of from the um, grower or in future it can be basically a commercial building or street lighting. So we provide access, uh, we provide hardware, we provide installations, um, uh, we provide software and then access to the database, basically how to manipulate with the software so they don't need to figure it out on their own. Mm -hmm. um, if anything happens, we just take care of it Yeah. through the partners. We do not do it by our team members. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, after you first put the system, so I mean, you don't have, I mean, so you get paid once or you get no, paid as monthly, it goes? it's a monthly payment. And what with the electricity? Yeah, I know. So That's what I'm trying yeah. to understand. So the, so the, gr uh, the facility starts start saving low. basically from the first months. Mm -hmm. uh, we've run various tests and like financial model as, and with our pilots, it's already working. So basically uh, they pay us monthly but they save on electricity already more than they pay us from the first months. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of the, this model and also um, <laughs> this is why it's a bit harder for us because we need to be quite financially stable to be able to provide that model. Thank you. It's very interesting. What's our manufacturing cost of all the equipment? Um, so uh, if we're talking about the uh, grow LED light, currently it costs around $40 without uh, considering the workforce, uh, it depends where you do it. Then the control unit uh, is around ten dollars plus minus, and then also the Wi-Fi control unit is the most expensive one. It's also around ten dollars, and we are planning to get rid of it. We already found a uh, partner who can substitute the Wi-Fi connectivity problem or issue with uh, another technology, which also will give access, but do not not going to require actually access to the internet. Um, and then uh, control unit software. Uh, yeah, uh, basically that's about it. What uh, about the operational costs? Uh, basically, we don't have any operational costs because our software is uh, uh, like kind of figured out. It's it, it, it's quite low. Let's say, let's put it that way. It's quite low. I can give <laughs> go into more details. Just if I would have time to give you an example, then I could explain it a bit better. Thank you, applause. <laughs> Thank you. Our next startup is Idiza. Welcome. Cheers. Three minutes starting now. Thank you. Hello. Hello, everyone. So let's say you wake up in the morning when you have a great idea. Uh, before that, you jump one. <laughs> let's say you wake up in the morning and you have a great idea. And you're born in Israel, so you are a very innovative uh, place. And if you have an idea in hardware, uh, probably you will stuck and this is the next one because we have great solution in hardware uh, in the software uh, tools and everything but when it's come to hardware we have a glass ceiling the journey from the idea to physical product is very long expensive and it's require massive and high level skills of hardware and software and everything and that's come to that that most of us are not trying to do something with that and with this pain, we come to solve, and this is the next slide, uh, and bring this solution that it's very simple. It's starting with a simple description. Uh, talk, think like uh, talking with uh, Siri or Alexa, describing your idea. We are using there then uh, um, NLP, National Language uh, Processing. Uh, from there, we are taking the description, and together with thousands of engineering rules and unique database technology and engineering database that we have, that we uh, create, uh, we are generating a 3D simulation of your idea, and it's include all the layers. It's include the hardware, the software, and the cover you have there. At the end, if you, if you want, after you get uh, the 3D model, you can modify everything, 
If you are happy with that, you are going inside a marketplace. Uh, there you have manufacture, all the manufacture that you have, that you want, a patent attorney, a cloud company, and more. So it's A to Z process for you, uh, fully automated. Uh, and this is the new world that we are <laughs> opening, and uh, this is uh, the order, our, our uh, order to open this op and give this opportunity to everyone, even if you're, you don't have this money, this uh, time, or the knowledge for that. Uh, and it's bringing that the, all the projects that didn't saw the sunlight before can come true now. Uh, we founded the, in 2017. Uh, from then, we have a alpha version and beta version. Um, a very strong uh, IP. We have uh, 100 uh, beta users. A great uh, success story from there. Uh, the team, uh, we have 20, 30 employees from all over the world. Um, Moran and I are the founder of the company. The, our CMO was the CMO of Samsung in New Zealand. He brings us all the opportunity, knowledge, and marketing to the big world, the B2C market. Uh, the next one, we won through competition. We are raising now $4 million to take the uh, platform that w from the step that we are now to the commercial launch. Uh, co we connected the, with a few universities in Israel and in the world uh, to create an um, innovation competition for the students through the uh, platform. And we was in uh, China nine months ago, uh, connected in a few provinces. We connected with uh, 12 uh, manufacturers. And uh, we are here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable judges. Can you tell us about your business model? Thanks for presenting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, our business model is uh, think about it. Starting from the B2C uh, level that we have today, think about uh, GitHub or Wix or something like that. The first place that you are coming inside is a public license. It's for free. You are playing with the platform, and you can see what you have. You can share it. You can do whatever you want. In the, uh, we are generating revenue if you want to save your IP from the machine, from the wall, or entering into the marketplace. When you are going to there, we are, you are entering into a SaaS model. And we have also fee from the third party companies because it's like a marketplace. So we have both of them if you are going inside there. And there it's depend on the, how much fees is depend on the company. And have uh, any customers gone through the A to Z process uh, yet? Yeah, we have, a, I, I will mention one of the, be I think the best, best uh, story that we have today is one of the uh, big company here in Israel that they connect with us, uh, one of the beta users that we have. And after, uh, um, prototyping and a better side of the product. He, we are now in the process to mass production with him. Um, again, the idea here is jumping on all the thousand of the years that uh, I think we have here a lot of stuff start that, that can show it. This is my experience also that it's taking years to get the prototype. <laughs> and you need all this experience and everything. And here you get, the, uh, I will bring another story. The one, uh, it's a serial entrepreneur. He don't have any uh, engineering knowledge. He come with the uh, IoT idea. And after two days, he showed the 3D simulation to investors and get money for that. So, and he has the blueprint, he has everything. And this is our dream. This is our uh, mission. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Going to our next victim, which is Dioxins. Applause. <laughs> Three minutes. Started in about one minute. Hi, hello, good evening, everyone. I am Tidha, the Accent CEO. I'm very excited to be here. We, in the Accents, provide uh, industrial companies and manufacturers in advance indication about mechanical failures and misalignment and malfunctions much before it became into uh, operational disruption. I mean, much before the shit happens. Now, we are looking, um, as a result of our work, we reduced downtime uh, of uh, mechanical system uh, anywhere from 70 to 90% over the course of about 12 months. We are looking for manufacturers, for operational managers, for uh, maintenance managers who are dream to take their maintenance to the next level. This is what we do. Now the problem is quite obvious. Things that are not monitored 
and not analyzed cannot be improved. Today, in most plant and factories, there are a lot of old equipment that is not monitored. It has no connectivity unit, no sensors, and no PLCs, and uh, deploying a control system is very uh, um, inaffordable solutions and uh, sometimes impossible solution. Our solution is a retrofit kit that uh, turning any dumb device into smart equipment. Um, you can do it by a touch. This is a simple beacon, and we are working with beacon as well. You can do it by a touch, the, retro uh, the retrofit kit to each mechanical system, such as boosters, pumps, AC motors, whatever, and it starts collecting the data. It measures the, the temperature, it measures the vibration, and maybe sometimes the um, current consumptions, and I can produce the, um, the production line manager's insight about his, uh, about his line, what's happening. Now we can know if the machine is stopped working, when it's working, and uh, in what throughput and whatever. Now, our unique sales propositions is doing all our capabilities and running predictive maintenance at the edge. This is the, um, as you may know, deep learning algorithm uh, facing with many challenges, such as overfitting, um, high rate of false positive, uh, misdetection, uh, they cannot deal with complex data, complex situation, and uh, most of them are, um, work well with only one unique um, um, object in a specific environment. Okay, and at the bottom line, uh, deep learning algorithm um, uh, need a lot, a huge amount of data and uh, outstanding uh, computing power in order to provide the model that reflect the normal behavior of the machine. Now. Uh, we succeeded in the accident, succeeded to overcome those challenges, and uh, we, we don't need any uh, p um, powerful CPU and outstanding uh, <coughs> huge amount of uh, data in order to provide an accurate model that could uh, anticipate the machine behavior. Here is Thank you. Track records, and I am looking for doing business in China because China is, is the center of the factories of the, in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, judges. Hila, please. Hi. Hey, how are you? Um, so what exactly are you planning to do in China? Do you want to produce in China? Do you want to also offer it in factories or? Um, okay. Um, we are focusing in what, the, in what we are good in is with, with algorithm, okay? And I'm looking to do business in China because actually ch um, uh, Chinese manufacturers are looking for predictive maintenance solutions. And uh, by offering, um, it's also, let's say, light control system, because offering uh, tools to monitor uh, old machines and provide them indication about what's happened with the machine, it's uh, uh, very useful, uh, uh, particularly in, in, in China, okay? They're looking for cheap and uh, reliable solutions to measure and uh, uh, anticipate the machine behavior. Okay. And today the product is ready for Chinese factories or you need to translate it to Chinese or you have that covered? There is two phases. First of all, uh, we, uh, today we are acting like a, a company that provides uh, services for control system. It's add-on uh, add to control system like an application that interfacing with control system and providing insight for the user, taking the data from the database, analyze it and provide alert and uh, insight to the uh, user. The user is the maintenance guy that's sitting in the control room. Now, we are, um, the next step is uh, providing all our capabilities and put it in the common controllers. You can imagine what benefit will be for the producer, for the manufacturers, if such kind of uh, uh, maintenance capability will be uh, inside this common controller, inside this uh, product. For example, if you have a refrigerator, uh, washing machine, whatever, mm -hmm. and it will alert you about the problem that are going to be and you will be more, let's say, um, smart when you are calling to a technique, thank you, in order to know what is going on with your products at home. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just about the team. The team. Um, we are five people at the company, okay? Two, uh, with me it's even three software uh, engineer, uh, one data scientist, and um, uh, Roy is with me is the sales manager in the, and businessman in the company. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Our next startup is going to take us to Mars. So, Mars storytelling, please. Thank you. Hello. Okay, so, hi everyone. I'm Gilad. I'm the CTO and co founder of uh, Mars. And I will start with a quick story on how we founded Mars. Uh, while I was working in uh, Apple, I took a vacation to Mexico, and two of my friends called me. And they asked me, uh, they are both from a director, they are both uh, for storytellers, and they had an idea how to make a personalized uh, mixed uh, experience reality, uh, mixed reality experience um, in the new technology and the new age. And they asked me how we can do it. And we started to realize that there is a huge problem that we all. Uh, can agree on, we see the disengagement uh, in the visitor centers nowadays more than ever. Uh, the youngest uh, the audience uh, don't look on their Rembrandt uh, beautiful painting, uh, rather they look on their iPhone. And <coughs> we believe that uh, if we can have a, a new approach on how to present to them that uh, history and the visitor centers, um, we can make um, better engagement. So how are we going to do it? We're going to do a personalized mixed reality, uh, which means that uh, we adjust the content for each person according to the way that we believe that you should have it. And we will explain you shortly how. But for example, take uh, my sister and my nephew that they went to the Machu Picchu in Peru. My sister, my older sister, she would like to see, show us what you want to see. She would like to see the Inca information, uh, all the details and the story timelines uh, of the Machu Picchu. While my nephew, what he all cares about uh, is the trials and the chief, and he wants to see the battles and maybe a gamification. So now they both can enjoy the same place, different content according to their uh, own uh, personalized behaviors. And how we, gonna, how we are doing it? We're doing it by subconscious trigger, which means we implemented during the uh, story, we implemented uh, subconscious triggers, we analyzed the user behavior, behavior along these uh, triggers, and we know how to personalize the content according to his behavior. We can do it, okay, I have 30 seconds, so we know how to analyze the hardware camera and the attention and the emotion of the person. We have uh, a machine that knows how to start with the content, data collection, analyze the data, decision maker, which is our uh, machine, and eventually we know how to do the actionable insight. We have a B2B to see a revenue share for the visitor centers, which is our first stage, and the next stage is uh, the Goliath analytic tools to know how to analyze the user behaviors and help other creators make their own content. Thank and you, Mars. Thank no you, Mars. Back to Earth. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Sorry, it was very short. Question, guys. Which portion of this wonderful idea is already built? Okay, so uh, this is the slide that you, okay. <laughs> so the slide that we missed that uh, we already have uh, a full implemented idea in uh, Tower of David in Israel, in Jerusalem, one of the biggest visitor centers uh, in Israel. We have 500 uh, visitors uh, a year and our machine is already uh, gathering and collecting the data and starting to analyze the user behavior and give them the personalization. So for example, we have a few stations. This is generally that we take the people over there. You should come and see it. And you take the iPad with the earplugs and you start going to a travel time with David, King David. <coughs> and, um, Along the experience, you have several uh, locations where in some of them you can get an information. For example, if we believe that well, you are a more informative person, and while your children can have gamification and start shooting uh, uh, plans or whatever. So the content consumption is via the iPad or? Yes, the the today in Tower of David is via iPad, but because uh, it's a software that uh, runs on, uh, over Unity or on uh, Unreal and the data analysis is a software uh, deep learning uh, machine. There does not really um, any uh, concern about the hardware because we can implement 
it for HoloLens, for uh, Oculus in the future, or if uh, Apple will have their own AR and glasses? Last question. Yeah. So the gravity of the technology is the data collection and the understanding uh, what kind of uh, exactly. decisions we are putting. Exactly. Them. So the first stage is to, um, to make the augmented reality experiences because we know that we need to collect the data. Because we did the content, we had uh, the ability to implement subconscious triggers along this uh, content. But then we collect the data, we analyze the user behavior, and then we present to him and customize the content according to his behavior. And what we believe is the content that's relevant for him. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Start up is Mama Mia. Mia. Yeah. Mia is coming.
their platform, platform also for the second opinion. One of the main issues we need a very um, diverse research all over the world, Europe, China, United States, we talk with a lot of radiologists, and one of the problems is the lack of time and lack of radiologists. In, couple of, in some countries, the time that take to, to women to get the results is important, it can be also weeks. So this is the first need. They need something that will help them not to miss the, the, the points, something that uh, change between the testers, and it's already bringing the value. Understood. Um, what's the cost of uh, raising uh, the solution? All solution? Solution. Okay. So it depends. We are working on phases. Um, one of the main causes is, of course, uh, the images. We have cooperation with Shiba Hospital, one of the top ten hospitals all over the world. We have a lot of data from them, from HMOs. Now we have also um, in Europe, in China, collaboration for getting uh, uh, the data. And uh, this how we increase our cost. Um, I cannot say uh, exactly what will be the final price, but I think that uh, for POC we will need uh, between $1 and $2 million. Until now we are bootstrapping and we already have these wonderful collaborations, the uh, initiation of uh, algorithms. So very nice. Good luck. Thank you. So now we have a number of calls indeed, and going to a noble one as well, Baby Eric. What is the most important thing for a woman? Or let me ask you again. What is the most important thing for a woman that just became a mother? There is absolutely nothing more important for a mother than the well-being of her child, of her baby. Probably you notice I'm not a mother, I'm not a father. However, one time, long time ago, I was a baby. And at 30% of kids, I suffer from respiratory problems. The solution my parents found was to give me an invasive and uncomfortable face mask. We are baby bred, and we are ending with child suffering during respiratory treatment. There is an enormous need. One out of three babies suffer from respiratory treatment. Making uh, respiratory issues the most common chronic dis disorder during childhood. Just talking about the nebulizer market, it's worth over 870 million U.S. dollars, which is, which means an enormous market. So, what is the problem with current solutions? Current solutions, as I said before, they are invasive. They make children cry. They weren't made for, for children. They were made by adults for adults. There are procedures that take 20 minutes that the parents need to see their children suffering, so they are stressed, the babies are stressed, and also one big problem there is that big amounts of medication are lost. So we came with a big solution. We present Baby Air. Baby Air is a unique nebulizer and food system that basically ends with all these big pain points. So what is the key advantage of our product? So the babies can be treated while they are sleeping, so they don't need to be awake. Currently, face masks, they need to be away. Also, our product is inexpensive and simple, easy to use and transport, and there's no physical contact with the children. No one wants to see their children with a face mask. So, what are our achieve achievements? We have two granted patents on the US and the Euro European Union, but not only that, we have FDA approval, CE mark, we also have the, uh, getting the ICO now done on one certificate. So this means that our efficiency is real. We are not like, talking about games. 
Also, we have made, the, we received studies from leading scientific that prove that our product is better and the parents are more comfortable. Talking about our team, we have scientifics and our founders also have experience on business development. Really good experience. Actually, in our advisory board, we have a Nobel Prize winner that he will come on this Friday. So if anyone is interested to meeting one Nobel Prize winner of chemistry, please contact us after this ends and uh, we will be happy to hear. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your addressing. Can you tell us about the cost of such a solution and your pricing model? Yeah, I will tell you. Good question. Thank you. So basically, our cost is thirty-five dollars. Why we're going to China? It's because actually we are looking for strategic partners because we understand that China they can maintain the quality by reducing cost. That actually is our biggest problem we had. That thirty-five dollars cost is really, really expensive, and our total price is 70 US dollars. That is not the best price that we can offer. So we understand that going to China, the prices can be much better to families, and we can enter to every household, because as it's a big problem, and many children need this solution, we think that providing the best, uh, the best price is the best alternative. And today you're selling directly to mothers, or you're selling? We, are, we sell to different. We are our, our final users, children, basically the mother has the one who buys. However, we use retailers and pharmaceuticals as distributors, so that to access. Also, doctors uh, like act as our sellers, as they they sell us the product. The mothers will trust on our product, and basically we will have the best expansion. Did you get any funding? Uh, actually, we, this is Bootstrap, which is a family office that uh, developed this product. With the, here is the, the, actually the founder. That is completely Bootstrap, no investment to date. However, we are looking for that. We, we want to expand. It's our main objective, actually, to be all over the world. So for that, we need uh, to raise money. How long did you think to get uh, the approval? It took, it, took, uh, it took time. This product was developed like 10 years ago. So it was really slow how the process, as you know, FDA is, it takes time. But actually, now we have the certificate, the patents, and everything, so we can go to market. And yeah. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you very much to the co-founders as well. So yeah, don't forget the fathers. Okay, guys, our next startup was the first one, but now is the last one. Let's hear it for Sands for us. Hello everyone. Hi, this is Larry Dwarkam. I'm founder and CEO of Sensoros. We are making farming smart and intelligent. As per the World Food and Agriculture Association, almost one third of the, uh, the soil already degraded because our farmers and the users are using a lot of fertilizer, pesticide. They're wasting a lot of water and they have no idea what's happening under the soil. So only, there is only one current solution in the available market for agriculture, which is the traditional soil health testing. So the farmers take a small part of some uh, soil, they go to the lab, and after an active process, they will get it, a certificate with eight parameters. But with the sense trust, we are solving one of the biggest agriculture problem of the micro soil data. We have three main components at sense trust. One is the NPK sensor, which measures almost uh, 18 to 20 parameters. So we are the most innovative hardware company, Actec, who measures 18 to 20 parameters from one single hardware. 
uh, if you can see, we also measure not just the fertilizer management, we also measure the carbon emissions, all these kind of gases and including the soil absorption capacity, which, which is going to tell you how much is the soil absorption capacity of the nutrition. So if you see the mobile app, is an AI based app which can give you the, all the details overall the sense health of your agriculture, of your land as well as your crop. This is uh, again, if you talk about the impact and accuracy, we are almost 58% accurate in finding the soil absorption capacity and the fertilizer detection, which is more than 8% of the any other available solution in the market, which is the soil traditional method. The business model is quite simple. We have uh, hardware, which costs about $800, which you can pay through the subscription. Uh, we have software, which is $250, again, through the, you can pay through the subscription. And we have an agri consulting, which is an AI based personal agri consulting to the farmers and the users. Again, as I mentioned in the first slides, we are 360 degree solution. You can use our hardware, our solution, any part of the world, any part of the crop, and it's give you more than 20, 80 to 20 parameter in a single device. We already have attraction, more than 105 customers, including the company like Cargill, Paxico, we all have a good monthly recurring revenue of 4,800. Next one. Next one. Uh, most trusted and recognized startup. Uh, we just finished one of the accelerator program in Technion in Haifa, and uh, we all we almost raised 250k from hacks uh, and other ex hardware accelerator. Next one. Next one. So r r why we are here? Because China is not a production city anymore. It's from iPhone to a small shirt button is making it uh, China. And that's why we are here so looking forward from China to make this one of the most innovative hardware company. And it's innovative in France and produced in China. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's amazing. Uh, I uh, no uh, that's been around agriculture, but uh, how do you quantify the value of this technology? So we usually, uh, when we did the pilot and we would be, before we go into the market, we evaluate through the three competitive methods. The first is the soil, soil traditional method. We go to a standard demo farm. It's a one acre farm. We measure the same fertilizer from the soil traditional method, the traditional lab method. We take the another nearest competitor and then we do the comparison. Understood. And in that comparison, how much money would you say to the farmer? Uh, the farmers are like, they have very high expertise about farming. So if, for example, if they were getting uh, 100 kilograms of crop yield in one acre previously, and if they are getting 135, they don't need any technical tool to, you know, to justify your technology. So this after almost like three big uh, uh, pilot, one in US, one in Europe, and one in India, we found out that the farmers are certified that they have like these kind of figures. So when we come up with the figure, this is certified by the government bodies and the farmers. How many people work for your, uh, your startup? So we have a team of 11 people, 3 co-founders and 2 non-co-founding members, 4 interns and advisor mentor from Facebook, Microsoft, AI, and Google. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all of our startups. We've just heard 10 wonderful startups. We're wishing good luck to all of them. The judges have taken their notes. And we are taking a 10 minute break. We're going to be very strict with the 10 minutes. 8 or 5. Okay, 8 or 5. We'll be back here. After the break, uh, we will we have the interview with Abiyad Arel, our honorable guest. Here, applause please. <laughs> and right after the interview, the three winners who will go to China will be announced. Okay, so this is this is Startup Run that will be when we are happy to have a fireside chat with Aviad Arel from SciSense. Applause, a round of applause, please. Aviad, thank you, thank you very much for coming. Sure, it was my pleasure. Um, so let's begin with your, uh, your background. Please tell us uh, a little bit about yourself, about how SciSense started. So uh, hi everyone, excited to be here. Um, my name is Aviad Arel. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of uh, SciSense. 
I'm also acting as the COO of the company and the GM of uh, the Israel site. Um, we started uh, Sisense 15 years ago, which is shitloads of time. Uh, we started uh, the company in a quest of changing the way business intelligence users are using, maintaining, and deploying <coughs> business intelligence solutions. For those of you who don't know what uh, business intelligence is all about, business intelligence is um, the tools that allows people to connect to data and to gain insights into or from the data and to create or generate some value uh, from the data that they have. So this is basically business intelligence. Um, we started the company, again, as uh, I mentioned, 15 years ago, right out of uh, college from IDC. I met uh, uh, my friends. It's almost a typical um, uh, story, uh, entrepreneurial story. We met in uh, college. Um, and uh, we started the company at the last year of uh, college, or we at least thought of the idea. And now uh, when we graduated, um, we started the company. Um, the, the claim for fame of our platform is the fact that our platform simplified complex data for um, business users. So the builders of the world, the, the analytical people that would like or need to connect to data um, without heavily de being dependent on IT or developer, can use our tool uh, to connect to data, uh, to pull data from different data sources, to mesh up data from different data sources all by themselves with um, uh, zero coding and zero scripting, um, mesh up the data, analyze the data, and distribute the insights to whomever they need in whatever channel that they need, either uh, alerts, dashboards, up, up, uh, text uh, messages, and so forth and so forth. Um, we are a global company. We have about 812 employees across the globe. Um, the Tel Aviv office is about 260 employees. Um, I just came back to Israel after six years in uh, New York. Uh, I moved to New York six years ago to start the U.S. entity of the company. Back then it was uh, only myself. Now we have in New York one, a little bit more than 160 employees. In Arizona, we have about 70 employees. And about four months ago, we bought a company in San Francisco. So now we have uh, 150 employees in San Francisco. We also have uh, small satellite offices in London, Kiev, uh, Tokyo, and Melbourne, Australia. That's it. OK, so very, uh, very nice growth. Um, can you tell us um, how did you know that you have that you are going to have a market for your uh, product? How, how did you know that you have the ability to build it? So we didn't, we just tried it, right? Um, when we started the company, we, um, the fuel that uh, uh, fueled us was a pure um, joy of creation. We had an idea of the market, we didn't really know the market. We knew only few, very few things about the market. First, it's a gigantic market. Um, secondly, it's, um, it's the opposite from uncharted territory. So there are a few companies that innovate in that market, but the market is gigantic. And we also knew that uh, there are a few things that can be done better in that market. This is basically uh, the knowledge we had on the market when uh, we started. Um, we were a little bit arrogant. We thought we can build a technology that uh, um, will um, uh, create some disruption in uh, that market. It took us way too long to do something around that. Uh, we know it in a hindsight, so it's a little bit easier. Um, but um, I think um, uh, self-esteem and, uh, and a little bit of arrogance was uh, the main ingredient in that. Okay. Um, and um, do you think that uh, any people here uh, in the audience can use your products? Sell us your products. So I'll tell you a story about that, and you can judge by yourself. So um, our current CEO, we have a professional CEO. I uh, brought him to the company about uh, four years ago. Um, <clears throat> although he has a technological uh, background in the recent uh, few decades, he's not a technological per se uh, uh, person. Um, so I thought it would be a good idea to teach him the product. It took me about two or three days to teach him how to operate the uh, product. 
Um, about a week later, I started to get uh, weird phone calls at uh, weird times of uh, the day from our CEO uh, telling me something um, similar to the following. He told me, Aviad, I connected the data from Salesforce together with the, connect, uh, with the data from Zendesk. Zendesk is a support uh, uh, platform. And I found some interesting insights about the volume of noise that the least paying customer of ours um, creating. What's the reason for that? Having that phone call made me understand that uh, in two days I was able to, to teach someone who is completely ignorant around what BI is, how to use the product and to harvest insights from completely two desperate uh, data sources which made me very proud. I believe each one of you can do the same. Well, very impressive. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about some major crossroads in the company's path and what were the main cases for each uh, uh, direction and how did you reach a decision? Great question. So there were very important uh, points of times or pivotal points of time within the company history. <coughs> so uh, uh, just to give you a background, SciSense is a typical company in terms of the age. Uh, we started the company in 2004. It's a long, long time ago. Um, and it's because of a reason. The first few years uh, were probably the most fun years or the most fun time in the company but probably we wasted most of that time, right? Um, so the first few years, we suffered from what I refer to as a very typical entrepreneur syndrome. I call it the pursuit for perfection. We try to create the perfect product that will uh, take over the entire BI industry, $30 billion industry with one tool, which was in a hindsight, again, a big, big mistake. Um, we didn't know what we did not know, right? Um, and uh, we always had another great idea of what to add to the product. Um, and today I can tell you it was a big mistake. We wasted a few years. We could have probably released the first version of the product a few years earlier. And in, in the journey, in the life journey of a startup, a month is critical. So wasting a few years is very, very critical. It was uh, very painful. Um, you know what uh, made us release eventually the product? Tell us. We ran out of money, um, which is a great enforcement uh, uh, to push the boundary of uh, what you can uh, do. But after releasing the product uh, to the market, we understood how much we did not understand about uh, uh, the market, about the product, what is the ideal product in that market. Um, and it was a, a great um, uh, real life university uh, for us, the founder. So this is one pivotal moment. So talk to your customers early, right? As early as you can. Right. Um, so you've grown well. What are your tips for healthy growth and for scale? So it's an amazing question because I think every two years the definition of a hyper-growth company is changing, right? Uh, when we started to uh, double the company every year was uh, amazing. Now I see companies that are uh, tripling the company uh, every year is not enough. So it's heavily depends on the market, on the atmosphere, the, the scene that uh, you uh, exist in. Um, I'll tell you the following. Um, it depends a lot about the market. Uh, if you take a very crowded market, like Sisons, like, like we, we chose, uh, for Sisense, which is a very crowded uh, market, there is no place for small companies. Small companies will evaporate. Uh, so the growth factor is crucial. If you won't be able to gain critical mass in the market, you'll disappear. Somebody will, will eat you or will uh, uh, take all, your, uh, all the ground beneath your uh, feet. So growing in a very crowded market is crucial. There are other markets that are not that uh, crowded and competitive, <coughs> and the approach of uh, uh, becoming or building more bootstrapped and self-sustained uh, startup makes more sense. There's no better or worse. It's a different thing, okay? So take that into consideration. Okay, um, so you've grown really well, and I'm sure that you've had 
exit offers. Um, can you tell us about the decisions of taking them or rejecting them? So without getting into too many details, I believe that every successful and hyper-growing company uh, creates some interest with other potential buyers. It's, it's a natural thing. Again, especially in a hyper, um, hyper big and very crowded uh, market. Um, just to give you an example, we're, uh, the Sison story is the David and Goliath story, right? We're competing against Power BI by Microsoft. We're competing against uh, Tableau that were uh, uh, recently purchased by uh, Salesforce for uh, $14 billion. Um, we're competing against ClickView, $4 billion company. And, uh, you know, it's a small startup from uh, Tel Aviv that started small uh, in Tel Aviv. Um, when you are able to overcome these challenges, it creates interest with other companies. Uh, I can tell you one thing. I believe that uh, the scenery or the atmosphere within the uh, technological uh, or technology scene uh, in Israel is changing or changed in the recent years. And the um, uh, creating uh, the idea of building a company to sell it while it's still growing is still appealing, but there is also or a bigger appealing concept with founders, and I see it with my communication with founders, other founders, and this is to uh, the idea of building a great independent company. And this is what uh, we're focused on in Sison for the last decade. Like an Israeli Nokia equivalent, right? Like an Israeli Sison. Israeli Sison's, yes, uh, that's, uh, that sounds well. Um, what will it require for uh, the state of Israel to have more Israeli Sison's, uh, big uh, independent companies? It's a, a great question. I believe the first and the foremost thing is a mind, sh mind, mind shift or mindset shift of uh, the entrepreneurial scene within the company. No more quick uh, exits, more focus on building great, innovative, global, independent, high scale, high growth uh, companies. Uh, it should be something that um, people have craving to build because without that, it's a very difficult and challenging journey, uh, almost impossible journey. And uh, only the people that uh, likes to operate in this kind of uh, uh, journeys, the impossible journeys, are best suited uh, to build these kinds of uh, companies, but they need to start with the willingness of going through that, uh, this kind of uh, Via de la Rosa, or the uphill, constant, constant uphill uh, battle when they're building uh, their companies. How do you build a company with a great, um, how do you build an international company? So when, when, first, when do you decide that you need to uh, uh, expand internationally, that it's, that it's time? How do you do it? How do you uh, build a culture? Who do you send abroad, etc.? Again, a very uh, excellent question in my uh, mind. Uh, this is something we at Sison struggle a lot. Um, there is the famous saying, at least famous to me, that uh, when you want to start a startup, start it in Israel. When you want to scale a startup, move to the States. Uh, there, is, there are few truth in that kind, in that uh, uh, sentence. Um, Israelis and the con current culture in Israel, um, I'm not trying to include everyone, um, is to build quick and dirty and very innovative and creative solutions. Uh, the mindset and the culture within America or North America is how to build more repeatable, scalable processes and products. It's a different mindset, it's a different skill set. Different people can uh, uh, excel in each one of uh, these uh, disciplines. Um, we started our global expansion about six years ago. I mentioned it earlier. Um, we decided that uh, we were able to track the first few customers out of uh, the States, very few uh, millions in reoccurring uh, business. We were able to do that out of uh, Tel Aviv, but we understood that there is a glass ceiling for that. It's not the language barrier, it's not the culture barrier, but there is uh, nothing like having presence on the ground in the main market that you try to 
uh, win. <coughs> so about six years ago, um, I'm, uh, I was the founder that the rest of the founders decided to exile to New York. Uh, so I took one for the team and I moved to New York. Um, and uh, we started our first entity outside of uh, Tel Aviv. It wasn't an easy journey. You start, it's like starting a new, completely new uh, startup, right? From finding a space, uh, buying the, 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 the chairs, the tables. Uh, my first recruit was the office admin. I hired the first office admin to help me. Then I started uh, focusing on hiring very talented, capable sales executives, which was a big failure, okay? Why is that? It's a different skill set to build an organization from, from scratch rather than take, taking an organization that already operates and scale it. Completely different uh, skill set. I learned it in the hard way, right? I hired people that knows how to scale um, uh, organizations and uh, processes uh, versus finding people that knows how to build sales organization from scratch. So it took us some time, but uh, we were able to find the first uh, VP of sales in uh, North America that was the right kind of persona with the right uh, kind of uh, skill set to build the team. And if you refer to the culture, this is a different, completely big challenge, uh, mostly for Israeli companies. This is why I advise many entrepreneurs that are uh, starting to think about their global expansion to actually start in New York. New York, in terms of culture, is much closer to the Israeli culture versus the Silicon Valley culture. Um, we did not have a presence in the Silicon uh, Valley until very recently when uh, we purchased um, a company called uh, Periscope Data. Um, and I can tell you that the cultural challenges and consideration we had to take in order to observe them and in order to allow them to observe us as the buying uh, company were far from being uh, trivial. Um, so if I can give you one advice on um, uh, scaling your uh, company into the state starts with New York, it's easier. And by the way, traveling to New York is much easier. It's like 10 hours flight, you take the red eye, it's pretty, I do that almost every other, other week. Okay. Um, if, you, if we've uh, discussed the differences between uh, uh, cultures, what about uh, some uh, maybe things that Israeli startups tend not to do as well as uh, in other places? So things that Israeli startups generally could improve on. So many things, and I'll uh, talk about myself. When uh, I moved to the States, I saw it was uh, like a mirror to my face of the, um, I'm going to use a Hebrew word, so sorry for that. I'm not sure I know how to translate it. Chaperiut, uh, that uh, Israelis have in their nature. Now, again, when you build a new initiative, it's crucial, you know, the, <laughs> this um, hand movement, we will figure it out. It's very good and very resourceful when uh, you try to conquer the world and to build something from uh, scratch. Uh, but uh, when you start a secondary office uh, in a different time zone, and you want to penetrate a new market, it doesn't work, okay? You need to Le understand. You're referring to lack of professionalism, yep. right? You yeah. need, it's not only the technological depth. It's also how you, for example, the concept, the notion of having a product marketing to a product. Few people that sit together, look at the product and understand how to communicate that product into the market. It's not marketing, it's not PR, it's not going to conferences. Is to draft the message, the differentiation of uh, the product. We in Israel, prior to our uh, establishment in uh, New York, we tried to do that, you know, in afterthought, right? We have a great product, we have this feature. It's meaningless, this feature. Uh, there is a concept called uh, architecture. is looking into your product, looking into the market, and create a architecture, like a architectural design of the marketing initiatives and the messaging uh, that's going to um, uh, guide you through the communication of your product and your initiative and your business initiatives into the market. This is something 
that uh, we did not know that uh, there is a concept like that. And the importance of it uh, is of great deal. And this is one example of not being a hopper. This is a great example of taking something and diving to the great depth of what it means to build or to communicate your product outside uh, to a new market. Okay, very, very well, thank you. Um, can, what can non-tech uh, startups learn from tech startups? So I think uh, one thing that, um, maybe I'm not objective because um, uh, I have an analytical uh, company, uh, but uh, being data-driven, I know it's almost a cliche uh, these days, uh, but being truly a data-driven company and take decision that as much as possible, you cannot always, but as much as possible based on data is of gigantic value to every growing startup. With technology companies, it's easier to collect the data because it's um, a digital software, right? So you can collect the data easier. With non-technical uh, uh, startup, it might be a little bit harder, but it's worth the effort in making sure that you will be able to collect the data, analyze the data, and make some sense in the data that will allow you to understand how to grow. I want to push back a little bit on this one. Um, so it was published um, a few days ago that one of the um, uh, designers at Google left because uh, they were uh, market testing whether the uh, borders of the fonts of their logos should be three points or four points or five points. They m tested that, A-B tested that to their uh, to the customer. He said, I, I don't want to work here. Like if this is how you uh, gather data about every, every single thing, it's, uh, it's too much. So when do you draw the line? It's a very interesting question. There is a concept in analytics that is called analysis paralysis, right? At some point, when you try to analyze the hell out of a specific concept, you can uh, um, get lost with all the details, right? If you dig enough into endless um, uh, theories and numbers, you can prove that uh, smoking is healthy, right? Um, so you need to be smart on that. I read a Harvard Business uh, Review once about uh, uh, the right uh, equilibrium between taking decisions based on data and gut feeling. Um, and there is an equilibrium. Uh, you should not take the uh, decision only by data. You should, you know, spice it a little bit with a uh, good old fashioned, uh, very human gut feeling. It, uh, I think, makes a lot of difference. It should not act as an excuse of not collecting the data and not testing uh, stuff and not analyzing stuff, but it's not uh, the, the face of everything. Data should support your decisions, not be everything, right? It should support and guide your decision. It should not be everything. Okay. Um, what makes Sisense also a great place to work at? And how, how did you achieve that? What did it take to achieve that? So I'll tell you a few stories about cultures because I think cultures as a concept is a fascinating thing. When you start a company, culture is not the main consideration of yours. And rightfully, you need to build the product, you need to understand the market, you need to penetrate the market, uh, and so forth and so forth. But uh, at some point, at some uh, uh, scale, culture becomes the glue that uh, uh, keeps the people together. And then you find yourself investing a lot of time, and large portion of my time goes to cultural-related challenges or questions. Right? I'll give you one example that I've learned recently from the company we uh, bought in uh, the <laughs> Silicon Valley. So the company we bought in the Silicon Valley, uh, the name is Periscope Data. It's about 150 employees there. One of the biggest challenges in Silicon Valley that in Tel Aviv becomes a little bit uh, similar to that is the talent pool. Right? Uh, engineers in the Silicon Valley is, or hiring engineers in the Silicon Valley is a big, big challenge because of multiple reasons. First, um, the, the recent generation or the millennial generation of uh, developers in the Silicon Valley has a specific kind of culture. Okay, we can talk about it. Um, but uh, secondly, there is a lot of demand, incredible demand for developers. A developer in the, in the San Francisco office of Sisense, when he sneezes, he gets a job offer from one company across the block. 
uh, with 40% increase in uh, the current comp that uh, uh, he gets. This is almost impossible market to operate in, and this is a big challenge. And you need to find techniques how to deal or to operate in that uh, market. Periscope did something very, very, very smart, I think. They bet on culture, and I'll explain. Um, they took two concepts of their culture, inclusiveness, or being inclusive and being kind, that for us Israelis sounds a little bit uh, uh, corny, uh, but they took it to the extreme, okay? They, w they tried to build the most inclusive and kind company in the Silicon Valley, not because they really want to be the kindest company in the, in the Silicon Valley or the most inclusive company in the Silicon Valley. This is, was their strategy, the, the ace in the sleeve of how to recruit and hire specific people. How to attract and maintain people. Exactly. So the strategy was that if they will find an engineer that cares deeply about inclusiveness and being kindness, he will prefer to work for them instead of working for Uber in 20% increase of uh, salary. And as a result from that, when I looked or when we did the due diligence uh, to buy that company, we found out an engineering team with 51% females in the engineering team. We found a company with 60% of their executive people are females. And they worked very hard to achieve that. And it created some kind of a culture that females engineers specifically prefer to work for Periscope Data rather than working in Google. Why? Because they feel better to work for that kind of organization. So again, not they created or they double backed on that culture, not because they wanted to be so inclusive or specifically they cared about that. They do care about that, but this is not the main reason. It was a recruitment and uh, attrition fighting techniques that they chose and it worked perfectly for them. Another uh, cultural question. Um, what will get uh, someone, a worker at Sisense, fired that might not get them fired elsewhere? What will get them promoted or um, uh, given uh, a, a raise that might not work somewhere else? So I don't know about other places. I can uh, advocate about Sisense. So there are many things that I and the entire company looks in candidates when we recruit them. And I won't talk about it because it's almost obvious. I will talk about what we do not look in candidates or what we want to avoid with candidates. What are the red lines? So we have two main red lines that again, sounds very obvious, but you will be surprised how many companies do not uh, invest in that. We do not hire assholes. I don't want any assholes in the company. And uh, we do not hire stupid people. Uh, so these are the two red lines. Um, what makes employees successful in Sisense? Again, this is very Sisense objective, right? I, I really don't know about other companies, but uh, with Sisense, it is and it always was an uphill battle. It's never easy to work for Sisense, never. Nobody in Sisense, none, will uh, describe their experience in Sisense as easy peasy. Just came to work and it was easy for them. Maybe other founders are smarter than me and build easier companies to build, but with Sisense, it's always an um, uphill battle. And as a result from that, the most recognized employees are the ones that knows how to operate in uphill battle with joyment, with a, with a smile on their face. They come to the office, they know it's going to be a, a crazy hard day, uh, and they come to the fight with sheer pleasure and uh, fight pleasure and uh, uh, craving to be a winner. This is what we recognize in Sisons. Very nice. Uh. <laughs> okay. um, I need your mic. Thank you. Okay, so um, there for the for the tech oriented uh, audience, what are or were some uh, two or three biggest technological challenges that you faced, and how did you solve them? Wow, this is a um, two days workshop. <laughs> um, okay, okay. I'll start with uh, one of uh, probably the main IP of uh, the company. So uh, <coughs> when we started the company, we understood, as I mentioned earlier that uh, the biggest challenge and at the same time the biggest opportunity is to simplify what it takes to uh, implement a BI project. 
This is what we wanted to do. We wanted to have a platform that allows the business users, the consumers of the BI, be the one that actually implement the project and not the one that order the project from the IT or from uh, the developers. And in order to do so, we understood that we need to build something new. We had to build an analytical or a query execution engine. Now, don't be confused with the database. So both of them holds data and knows how to execute uh, queries, but uh, the experience that we aim for is completely different. We wanted to create an experience that allows um, a BI interactive experience for our users. And in order to build that, we had to build a query execution engine. And uh, for those of you who are uh, technical enough to understand what it means, it's a lot of work and very complex work. Fortunately, one of uh, the co-founders, which is way smarter than me, is Eldad Fargash. Um, he's uh, the CTO and he took upon himself the challenge of uh, creating that kind of technology. And the first four years uh, of Sysense were focused on building um, the facade uh, on top of that uh, technology, building the technology and the facade on top of it that enabled all the later um, product capabilities that we build on top of it. How do you see the future of, uh, of the market, of Sysense? Um, how will you uh, be affected by the Internet of Things? Great question. There are, there are many dimensions that impact our market. Uh, Internet of Things is one of them. Fortunately, uh, the BI market or the analytics market or the data-related uh, market is only growing. Data is a new oil. We heard it today, I think, uh, and it's true. Today, more than ever, every um, teenager can create an app that uh, uh, generates hundreds of millions of records in logs or whatever kind of information that you can think of. So the need for data, the importance of being able to collect data, analyze data, and find or um, uh, mine uh, insights in data is only growing. In that regard, I have um, um, full um, encouragement from uh, the trajectory of uh, the market. That being said, it's very crowded market because what I've said, uh, and um, participating in a game in such a crowded market, it has a lot of opportunity, but a lot of challenges. As I mentioned earlier, the David and Goliath game. But it also mean uh, two things. First, there are always a place for a niche. Now, a niche in a $40 billion market can be $3 billion uh, niche, which is a gigantic niche. And secondly, if you take the um, uh, cars industry, you have Mazda, you have Honda, both of them making shitloads of money. Um, this is the benefits of working in gigantic uh, uh, markets. Simplify BI solutions, for example. So BI solutions that are not aimed for IT departments or developers. For example, this is one niche. Um, embedded analytics, meaning building a platform that uh, the, the consumers are not people that use a platform for analyzing the operational aspects of the company, but embedded into their product. They're creating or they want to build analytical capabilities to their product. So it's another niche. Um, other niches are endless, the vertical niches. Analytical in healthcare, analytical uh, analytics in um, HR, which is booming in the recent years. So it, I just gave you an example of multiple um, uh, niches. There are many companies uh, in the market, each one of them choose a niche, or most of them choose a niche. We, the, the flavor of the company, or the claim for fame of Sysense is not a vertical, we build a, a development platform for business uh, intelligence, but for people that do not know how to code or do not want to code. So low code, no code um, market in the BI. And lastly, if you want to have a solution, one of uh, the things that I really like is early in the process when we were able to crystallize the go-to-market and the added value of the uh, product, we created a very unique way to POC our product or to enable our customers to POC our product. And we had a very famous uh, claim that uh, became uh, very 
uh, noticeable and associated with Sysense. Give us 90 minutes with your data alone and we'll show you some insights on your data. And uh, it worked brilliantly. Alone. <laughs> so um, what, um, what interests you today? What, uh, who can approach you uh, in what matters? And uh, what, what kind of um, uh, emails or uh, ap approaches do you um, uh, value? So first of all, the market is booming, right? In the last six months, Tableau was uh, purchased by uh, Salesforce. Looker was purchased by uh, uh, Google. Um, there are many forces that impact uh, the market. The main or the biggest force is the cloud vendors. So Azure of Microsoft owns the Power BI solution, for example. Um, Google now uh, has Looker. AWS has nothing and they need to move in that direction uh, and they have to. So it's just an indication of the, the boiling market that uh, we exist in. And being in that kind of a market, there are so many attractive opportunities in terms of cooperation with others from the de business development to harvesting the power of blooming uh, uh, technologies such as uh, data virtualization, query federation, and many, many others that you start to see the uh, pre-alpha product technologies out there and the future is bright for BI companies or analytical companies that will be able to harvest these uh, growing premature technologies in the long term. So if there is someone here that specializes in data virtualization or data federation, please reach out. Okay, and uh, any, anything that you'd like to add before we open it up to questions from the audience based on what you've uh, seen today, what you were asked today, etc. So um, although Sysant is uh, not a small company anymore, I can tell you that at least personally, <coughs> about once a month, I start to have uh, the crave of starting something new, right? Which is incredible. The, 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 the joy of creating something from scratch is something that uh, I believe is part of the soul of entry, every entrepreneur. Uh, the reason um, why I'm still within Sysense and not starting a new initiative is because I'm able, or Sysense is smart enough uh, to fulfill this kind of craving with what we're doing on a day to day. So in the last few years, every board meeting, I have at least one board member that reach out to me and ask me questions. And I understand that behind this question is actually asking me, uh, are you sure you're not going to leave us? Uh, something like that. And uh, I always stop him and I tell him, listen, dear board member, there are two reasons that I'm still within the company. First, I learn and I learn every day. Second one is I have shitloads of fun. The minute one of them will drop, I'm out, out of Sysense. That easy. Fortunately, for the last 15 years, um, I was able to fulfill these two uh, dimension of mine. Uh, but I think that um, this kind of mindset is what makes a successful entrepreneur a successful entrepreneur. At least it worked for me. Okay, so thank you very much for taking my questions. Now let's take questions from the audience. Feel free to um, uh, to moderate it, to select who you want to ask, uh, to, to get the questions from. Just repeat the questions because we don't have a spare mic. Sure. Yes, please. So, um, sh um, what's your name again? Lian. Lian asked about um, the China market or Hong Kong market. So, unfortunately, and it's a, a, a big unfortunate, um, we are not doing very well in China. We actually tried that, and we had a few customers. Uh, we probably were not prepared or didn't know the know-how of how to do that, but it didn't work for us. Um, I believe that uh, much like Japan, that I think in, in many ways there are a few similarities 
in how you penetrate that market. Um, we could have done that in China, but we didn't. We we'll probably uh, will do that again, and I'll explain what it is. Um, in Japan, we learned that uh, we cannot sell the product ourselves, at least at the beginning, uh, before we become a brand name. Um, the importance of building relationship with SIs, with system integrators and resellers in Japan, and building the ecosystem in Japan in order to penetrate that market is very, very important. This is something that when we tried to penetrate uh, China, we did not do. We did not have that arm, that muscle of ecosystem, and I believe it was one of uh, the main reasons why we did not have or experience huge success in China. It will happen one day, I'm sure. Yes, please. Uh, when did you decide to move overseas to expand your, uh, um, to expand your company? And uh, in a matter of talking, or from day one, did you uh, go global, or did you start only in Israel? So... So the first, uh, first the question, um, what, uh, what made us uh, decide and when to uh, go overseas? And the first customers, what, uh, what are they, overseas or locally? So um, I can tell you that the first customers of SciSense were Israeli customers, not because they were real customers, but because they were real supporter of the company. So the first real customer of SciSense was Wix, because we know Avishai and he's a dear friend of us, and he tried to help us a lot. This is something um, pretty unique to Israel uh, ecosystem, uh, so I can advise you to try to use it as well. So we had uh, sister companies or um, mentor companies to Sison that used our product, although it was shitty at the beginning, um, and they tried very hard to help us and to guide us in the right direction. The real customer, the first real customer that we had was from London. He paid us $56 for perpetual license, just to give you a reference. Now the entry price of Sisense is 35K a year. He bought it for 58 bucks. Um, he's no longer a customer. He's been a customer of us for two years, and then I'm not sure what happened to him. We lost contact. Um, we aimed for North America at the beginning as because of few reasons, the size of the market and the uh, maturity of the market and uh, mostly around BI uh, or a lot of, or because uh, of BI. We focused all our efforts, marketing, go to market, and um, we used inside sales techniques to penetrate that uh, market and it worked for us uh, quite well. At some point, when we understood we were able to build uh, somehow or somewhat repeatable process, sell, selling process, we understood that this is the time to go physically to the States and start an entity there. So we were about, I would say, a million dollar in recurring revenue, annual recurring revenue, about, I don't remember exactly, but then we understood that we know how to sell the product. We can sell the product at least to some extent, and uh, then we decided to move to the States. Yes, please. Given that you really made fast outdoor days, you got really fast uh, because you launched it in Japan, can you tell us uh, what you believe was the success that brought you out of the States? So um, what makes a, a, a successful SaaS company a successful SaaS company? Um, First of all, there are many, many shades of SaaS companies. I'll give you one complexity out of gazillion complexities that we have in SciSense. So although uh, we operate in many ways as a SaaS company, um, many of our customers download our product and install it, which is not a typical SaaS company. They pay us annually. We get notification and logs and metadata of how they operate with the product. We treat them or we operate as a SaaS company, but that specific shade of not hosting their solution, uh, at least for a uh, portion of them, is something unique to SciSense. So we are not a typical cloud SaaS company. We are a SaaS company. Um, we went or we grew through multiple generation of SaaS operations from selling our product in a monthly manner to move it to um, a yearly 
subscription, for example, we change our entry price endless times. We started um, at, I think the first annual uh, fee was about $1,500. We grew it all the time. Every time we thought or we started talking about uh, changing the entry price, we got gigantic reject from the sales team saying, we will not be able to sell it for that kind of price. Again, we started in uh, 1500 now it's $35,000 a year, and they're, they're kicking ass in selling Sisons. Um, so not being afraid of growing or, or moving up market in your, with your product first. Secondly, start, this is our experience, so don't judge me if it doesn't work for you, I'll tell you what worked for Sisons. Uh, us starting with an inside sales, inbound uh, sales machine was highly, highly effective for us. Uh, until today, Sisense is known in the tech community in uh, Israel, but also in New York, as the company that built probably one of the most efficient and mature inside sales organization. The way we, the complexity that we've implemented into the inside sales um, machine of uh, Sisense uh, was one of the main uh, growth engine of the company, the ability to forecast and to understand what it takes to grow uh, the market share of the company was heavily based on the fact that we chose the inside sales um, uh, techniques. Our ability, Sison's ability to sell over a million dollar worth of annual contract over the phone by using inside sales technique is something almost unique to Sison's. Not many companies are able to sell um, such a big contract over the phone um, by dimension and not with outbound efforts and enterprise sales uh, efforts, we were able to perfect that uh, system and it worked very well uh, for us. Uh, this system, the inside sales is very systematic. It allows you to understand, uh, to take a very complex problem, right? You ask a, uh, a sales guy, how, how, what's your forecast for the end of the quarter? And he tells you, I don't know, it depends on the leads. It depends on their ability to sign checks, right? So it's a very uh, big question. The inside sales allow him to break this question to, or this pro problem, sorry, to many smaller problems. Instead of how much money you're going to generate this quarter, you break it into lead generation department, how many leads you're going to generate this quarter. To the SDRs or to the qualification department, how many qualified leads you're going to generate this uh, quarter. Uh, to the sales guy, you have two phases. How many opportunities you're going to create this quarter, pipeline, and then, only then, you ask them, out of that pipeline of the opportunities that you have, how much money you're going to generate? It's a much easier question, right? So for us, the inside sales model was very important or almost pivotal to our growth in the SaaS industry. Last question, please. Yes, please. Should be much higher if you ask me. No, it depends. I don't know. I'm not sure which kind of companies uh, are using it. It's really depending on like a smaller startup. Maybe it's cheap according to the market. Might not be able to use it. Is it cheaper <laughs> considering? Like what's the price range in, in general? And, uh, price so price, price is never a question about money. It's a question about value, yeah. right? So $100 uh, dollars might be expensive for, I don't know, an Apple, not the Apple computer, like that, the fruit. Uh, but it might be very cheap to an Apple computer, right? So it's a question of uh, value. Um, Sisense is a premium analytical product, okay? Um, we empower business users, not magicians. The engineers are magicians. They can build whatever they want. They don't need a tool. They can build it by themselves, right? Uh, we allow less technical people uh, to find insights and to operationalize insight finding in uh, the data that the organization has. Um, so for that reason, it's not that cheap. It's not that uh, expensive. Um, the tool, how it works uh, for the time constraint, I'll give you the very high level concept. We have three main models in our platform. The first one is the Elastic Data Hub or the query execution engine, let's call it. It, in a nutshell, it empowers our users, simple users, to connect to multiple data sources by themselves, pull data from these data sources, 
big amounts of data, um, mesh it up together all by themselves without scripting, without coding, <coughs> prepare the data for analytics, and at the end of the day, it encapsulates the challenges of working with complex data, right? What makes data complicated? Two reasons, mainly. Big amounts of data, working with 500 million records, it's, it's complex, okay? Uh, there are textbooks, textbooks for DBAs, how to allow access for these amounts of data. With size and elastic cube, it's a no-brainer. Working with 500 million records is equivalent in the, in the complexity like working with 50 records. Second reason that makes data complicated is data that comes from desperate or different data sources that you need to mesh it up together. Size and elastic cube, it's extremely easy to do that. So this is elastic cube, the first module in the assembly line. The second one are the dashboard creation tools of ours. These are based on analytical language that we developed in-house in Sisons called UAL, Unified Analytical Language, that we built a very powerful GUI engine on top of it that allows our users to ask very sophisticated analytical questions very, very easily and in, in a very intuitive way without scripting and coding again. It allows them to create very complex, analytically speaking, dashboards, very shining dashboards, very, very easily. The last model in the assembly line are the, uh, the collaboration tools of ours. After you connected to the data, you messed up the data, you analyzed the data in a very simple way. You created dashboards or you analyze the data, you are able to distribute the insights to whomever you want while maintaining security rules in whatever channel that you want or need. So if you sum up everything we've created, we created an A to Z solution, a full stack solution that allow our users to own the entire BI project all by themselves, relatively very simple. We're selling our product B2B. Um, most of our customers are medium companies, but a few of our company, a few of our customers are the biggest companies in the world. Merck Pharmaceuticals, GE, uh, Airbus, Unilever, Rolls-Royce, Nasdaq, Motorola, Philips, Oppenheimer, probably forgetting few. So thank you very much for coming here <laughs> and taking our questions. Thank you very much. So let's, uh, let's move to the next stage of the evening. Yep. One last thing. We are growing aggressively, aggressively. Please log into our website, to the career page. There are a few probably hundreds open position within the company. Please do not hesitate. <laughs> Aviad, aggressively but nicely. Yeah. Thanks, Aviad. I really wish to thank you, Aviad. I think it was, Aviad, you were fascinating. You gave us great insight, really one of the greatest speakers. Thanks a lot for this. Now I wish to invite you all, all the judges, please come. Please come to the stage so we can announce the winners. Before a picture and a video, okay? So first a picture with the judges, yeah. then, uh, then all the teams. Mm -hmm.